All right, it's time for us to begin this morning. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Our gracious God, as we begin this time of study from your word, we pray that you would instruct us individually and corporately. We pray that we may learn those truths that will benefit us today, tomorrow, and even for the rest of our time as we live out our life that we may serve you more faithfully, more diligently, and that you can and will so work as to bring about your eternal will, plan, and purpose in each of our lives. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, <coughs> verse 57. Luke 9, 57, we'll be reading through verse 62. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, Go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. And another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. We learn, first of all, that those who would follow Christ and serve him must be willing to put their hand to the plow and never look back. Because looking back will cause you to be not fit for the kingdom of God. Putting one's hand to the plow means this. Take up the necessary means coupled with the required determination to finish the job, to successfully accomplish the task. Let me repeat that. There's several important elements. Take up the means. In our story, what are the means? Put your hand to the plow. The plow is the means. But it's more than just taking hold of the means. It's doing so with determination. Fixed determination to finish the job. There's an old expression which says, many begin well, but few finish well. In fact, we could probably add the words, few finish. The first man in our story is what we would say he was an unsolicited, unsolicited volunteer. Look at verse 57. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, there is his taking the initiative to say something to Christ. What did he say? I will follow you wherever you go. Now we're reading the Luke account, but the Matthew account tells us that this man was a scribe. 
And that's quite interesting. Because for a scribe to volunteer to follow Christ would be amazing. Simply because scribes, for the most part, were not friendly with Christ. They were hostile to Christ. So that tells us a lot about this man. The scribes were teachers. And it's interesting that in the Matthew account that this man refers to Christ as teacher. Again, that is really remarkable. Now, we don't know what motivated this man to volunteer. But we do know this. He doesn't really have any perception of what he's getting into. What's going, what it will involve if he follows Christ. Perhaps this man was given over to his emotions. Perhaps he had seen some of the miracles of Christ and that really stirred him up. He said, man, this is something else. I want to be a part of this. He may have thought, this is exciting. Wouldn't it be great to go from place to place with this unique man? and be involved in seeing these miracles take place? Or it could be because he was a scribe and a teacher that he was quite impressed with what Christ was teaching. That may have impressed him. He may have been willing to follow Christ just to hear what Christ was going to teach. Perhaps it would be something new, something he had never heard before. And he would be intrigued by that as a teacher. It seems that he did have at least some idea of what might be involved. Because notice in our account, he uses the word wherever. I'm willing to follow you wherever you go. And that little word, wherever, probably shows that he had some idea that it's going to meant travel. Travel always means inconvenience, doesn't it? And uh, so he had enough uh, foresight to know that, yeah, that it might. At least, at least this man was willing to pull up the stakes and follow Christ. But Christ could see right through this man, like he can each of us. He knows all there is to know about us, all of the intricacies of our life. He knows our thoughts. He knows our emotions. He knows our disappointments. He knows our frustrations. Christ knows it all. And he knew everything there is to know about this man. He knew more about this man than this man knew about himself. Notice in verse 24. Well, I'm sorry, not verse 24. L listen as I read to you John 2, 24 to 25. You don't need to turn there. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. He knew this guy throughout, thoroughly. And knowing it, Christ makes the issue very clear. And it's as if Christ is saying to this man, if you are serious about following me, you must be prepared not only to give up the comforts of home, you must be prepared to give up the comforts of life. And he was telling this man, emotional excitement and intellectual curiosity will only take you so far down the road. Because there's going to come a time when you won't be willing to do without, to suffer. 
it's as if Christ is saying, in fact, when night overtakes us, you will see the foxes curling up in their burrows. You will see the birds settling down in their nests. And then it will dawn upon you. I'm following a man who doesn't even have a place to lay down his head. Think about it. And you will be tempted to look back to the comforts of life. And once you look back, you will have proven where your real love and devotion is. That look back will disqualify you. That man seems to melt back into the crowd. You never hear of him again. And as far as we know, he never, never followed Christ. But what about the second man? Well, Christ speaks two words to him. Just to follow me. Follow me. Christ spoke those two same words to Matthew. And what did Matthew do? Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office and he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. No argument, no discussion, no looking back. Instant. When Christ spoke those words to Simon, to Andrew, to James and John, it resulted in immediate compliance. Let me read the part of the story. And it's found in Mark. And as he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, sitting, uh, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them two words, follow me with this explanation, and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left the nets and followed him. Do we hear of Simon? Do we hear of Simon? Do we hear of Andrew? Yes, we do hear of them. On and on and on and on throughout the scriptures. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants, and they went away to follow him. Do we read of James, the son of Zebedee, again? Do we read of John? Yes, time and time again. These men became faithful followers of Christ. No hesitancy, no putting it off, no excuses. Immediately they left all and got on board to follow Christ. You see, when God's word comes to us directly, personally, we are forced into making a response. There's no neutrality. There's no uh, thinking it over in a sense. It's not, it has to be a response when the truth is preached. Now, if the first man had an inordinate attachment to the comforts of life, this man had an inordinate attachment to his family. I'll look at Luke 9, 59. This would be the third. Luke 9, 59. And he said to him, another, follow me. But he said, permit me first to go and bury my father. Permit me, me first. Underscore those words. Me first. Some commentators think there may be reason to think that this man father, father had not died. And he just wanted to go home and wait for him to die. 
which could have been a week, a month, six months, two years. There's that possibility. There may have been more involved in just seeing to it that an already deceased father received a decent burial. But of this we can be sure, Christ knew the real circumstances about the man's father. And whatever Christ required of this man, although it may seem unjust and unfair, you can be sure it was right. Even if the father had died, if Christ at that point deemed it necessary for this man to forego the customary burial procedure for a father, then obeying Christ took precedence over custom. Let me repeat those words. Obeying Christ takes precedence over custom. The fact that Christ is sovereign Lord means that those who would be his followers must always obey his commands without any qualifications. And the truth of the matter is, just as with the first man, Christ could see through this man. Christ knew, apparently, that this man's father was not presently in dire need. This man was evading the issue. This man didn't want to come right out and say, I have no intentions of following you. He didn't want to do that, but instead he offers an excuse, an excuse that he thought would be acceptable. After all, how can you criticize someone for wanting to give loving care to their family? If a man has not intentions of obeying a Christ, dear people, then one excuse is as good as another. Christ knows whether or not there is valid reason. Obviously, this man was a quick thinker. He came up with that pretty quick. Or it could be that he had already been thinking about it, realizing that he might have to answer that occasion. It is obvious that he was not counting on Christ making an accurate assessment of his real situation. There's no record that this man ever followed Christ. And I wonder, as we sit here this morning, are we guilty of coming up with reasons why we cannot? Are they valid in the sight of Christ? Whatever the Lord may require of us. Well, I don't have time. I, I don't have the training. I, uh, whatever. It's amazing how many excuses we can come up with, isn't it? To excuse ourselves from, from doing what God would require of us. Our love for Christ must far surpass our love for even those who are nearest and dearest to us. We read earlier about Christ calling different ones, and what did they do? Immediately they left their father Zebedee. Doesn't that seem cruel? They left their father in the midst of work? Apparently Christ didn't view it that way. The third man, like the first, takes the initiative to, to volunteer. But he does so setting the terms, setting his own condition. Let me just make a statement here. If you ever follow Christ, it will be on his terms not yours. If Christ had just made a few allowances, think of it, with these men. If he had just 
been a little bit easy with them and reasonable, I'll put that in quotes, and made some allowances. He could have had a follower. He could have had another follower. He could have had this guy following her. And dear ones, much of today, evangelicalism is making allowance, making it easy. They're remodeling the narrow gate and making it wider and making it attractive, making it much easier to get through. There are no way for us to know what future demands will be made upon us in the course of following Christ. Jim Elliot, as you remember, was one of the five missionaries that was mortared back in probably the 50s. And if you've had occasion to read of his life, his biography, and particularly his diary, it seems that Jim Elliot knew that he was going to die early. Seems that he had that, that idea. Listen to the, these words that he recorded in his diary. He's talking about God. He makes his ministers a flame of fire. And then he writes this question. Am I ignitable? Put that together. He makes his ministers a flame of fire. And then he writes this question, am I ignitable? He goes on. God deliver me from the dread asbestos of other things. Saturate me with the oil of the Spirit that I may be a flame. But flame is transient, often short lived. Canst thou bear this, my soul, short life? In me there dwells the Spirit of the great short lived, whose zeal for God's house consumed him. Now listen to these words. Make me thy fuel. Flame of God. He was one of five missionaries brutally murdered. That's the language of a man who understands what it means to follow Christ. And so with this third man, it is the same as with the first two. Christ sees right through this man and discerns that this man has a basic defect. And it is this, he wants to follow Christ on his terms. He wants to set the conditions of how he will be involved and what he will do and how it will go. And here's the danger, and this is what Christ knew, and we need to know it and be aware of it. If allowed to set your own terms initially, it will characterize your entire life of always wanting to set the terms of how, when, how much, and so forth. You see, there's always something that we would like to do first, to accomplish, to arrange, to take care of, to put in order, to get caught up on. First. This kind of man would always be a hindrance in the work of the kingdom of God. He would never be able to depend on it. All three of these men had an inordinate attachment to things that would cause them to look back even before they put their hand to the plow. How much would they be looking back after the going really got rough. Plowing is hard work. 
Now, many of you perhaps have not had that much experience with a hand plow pulled by a horse. Um, the only real experience I have was when I would go to the, my granddad's farm in West Texas where he had a couple of hundred acres of land, raised cattle, pigs, chickens, had an orchard. He plowed a garden. He plowed to plant different things, potatoes and whatever. And I would be there as a young kid and it, it always intrigued me to see him get the plow out, hook it up to the horse and then start plowing of what we would call a furrow. Sometimes he would plow to plant, sometimes he was plowing to turn up the potatoes so you could go along and pick them up and put them in a bucket. But I can very remember all the work it was to hook up the horse to get that plow there I made out of iron, wood handles, and then jab it into the ground and tell, get the horse moving and get it into the ground and wrestle with that thing to get a straight line. It was work, hard work. One is covered with sweat mixed with dust, stumbling over large clods of dirt. The mule or the horse is hard, stubborn, hard to control, and you can think of a lot of reasons to look back. You can think of a lot of reasons to quit. Obviously, no man can do a decent job of plowing who is looking back. To plow a straight furrow, you don't look at the furrow from what I understand. You fix your eye on a post or something, an object, and you keep your eye on that. Do you know anything about it, Gerald? No. You don't? Okay, I thought maybe your parents might have done some plowing. But they tell me that you have to keep your eyes straight on that object. Because if you don't, you'll look back and your furrow, your row, your furrow is crooked. No man can be effective in the work of the kingdom of God if he's always having second thoughts about that commitment. He will always, always be a liability. Turn with me to Acts 14, verse 19. Because we want to read here about Paul and what Paul went through. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he arose and entered the city. And the next day he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. And after they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Let's pause a minute. Do you see that they had reason to look back? Second thoughts? Let's get out of here. Let's quit. This is a lot more than I thought it was going to be. Verse 22, strengthen the souls of the disciples, encourage them to continue in the faith. Notice, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with, with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed, and they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. Paul had been stoned and left for dead. He survives the ordeal, gets up, shakes the dust off, and he and Barnabas continue their work, preaching, teaching, strengthening the souls of the disciples. And then we read this statement, which obviously com comprised much of their teaching. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That simply means becoming a part of God's kingdom is not easy. That doesn't make for a very popular message. People would much rather hear how easy it is to be a Christian, how easy it is to serve the Lord. Christ always put the cost up front. Satan hides the cost in little print on the back. Christ puts it in bold letters right up front. 
If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. How many followers is that going to get? Christ taught, enter the, by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. Becoming a part of the kingdom of God not only means dealing with sin, it also means dealing with things. Things that are in and of themselves legitimate. But there must be a willingness to relinquish even good things in order that they may not become the enemy of the best. I believe it was uh, Dr. Bob Sr., Bob Jones, that had, had a saying similar to that. Don't let the good become the enemy of the best. You see, easy believism accommodates people, making it easy. Easy to get in, easy to continue, easy to look back. Christ said the person who looks back is not fit to be a part of the kingdom of God. Why? Here's the reason. Looking back is evidence of divided affection. Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife looked back. And that look was more than idle curiosity. She looked back because her heart was still in Sodom. If a man has reason to look back before he enters the kingdom of God, then certainly he will have much more reason to look back after he is in the trenches of spiritual warfare. It is true that there is no way that we can know what all the trials will be, what difficulties, what sacrifices we will experience, but there must be an unconditional commitment which has already faced the issue before it arises and of those same missionaries that I spoke a moment ago. Jim Elliot. When those five missionaries were murdered, the publishers of Life magazine, which was a very, very popular magazine in those days, went down to interview the wives. And they were sitting there talking to the wives about the massacre of their husbands. And one of the men said, one of the journalists said, we're sitting here talking to you about the death of your husbands and we see no tears. Why? And one of the wives said, we died before we got here. They had already faced that issue ahead of time. There's one further observation that needs to be made concerning these three men. Two of the three men said, me first. Me first. And Christ addressed the me first issue. Back in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first. First, the kingdom of God. Not second, not third or fourth. First. What does that mean? It simply means Christ's kingdom has priority. And whenever we allow anything to interfere with our commitment to God's kingdom, then in essence we're saying, okay, my own personal affairs are more important than the extending and the ongoing of God's kingdom. Christ made that statement in the context of people who were concerned with the securing of basic needs of food and clothing. Even our most basic needs are not to take priority over kingdom matters. I'm not saying that it is wrong to have the basic needs of life, to work hard and honestly to have our needs met. Nor is it wrong to enjoy the comforts of life 
which God is pleased to give. But it is wrong for any of these things to draw us away from fulfilling kingdom responsibilities. The story is told years ago that the Queen of England had some business that she wanted taken care of in another country. For whatever reason, she chose a man to carry out the task who was the owner of a shoe store. And she had him brought to the palace and she told him, I want you to do this and this in another country, travel and accomplish this business. The man said, what about my, what about my shoe store? She said, you take care of my business. I'll take care of your shoe store. You see, as Christians, we are subjects of the kingdom of Christ. We are subject to the rule of Christ. And how many days go by without any awareness of that fact? How many times does Christ call us to serve him and we have an excuse? How many important decisions do we make without ever giving the kingdom of God as much as a second thought? It's not that we are ignorant of God's kingdom. It's not that we don't want to get involved. The real problem is a me first mentality. Lord, Lord, just let me take care of this matter first. Then I'll be available. And as long as you have that kind of mentality, I tell you there will always be something to take care of first. Well, applications. I must hurry. There are a number of applications. Number one, various things motivate men to volunteer for Christ. Two of the three men volunteered. We can only spe speculate as to the motivational factor in their lives. As we pointed out earlier, it might have been a desire to be involved in the spectacular and the miraculous, perhaps even out of curiosity. But I want to submit to you this morning that all sorts of things can motivate us to get involved and to do this and to do this. And I want to be a missionary and I want to do that. There can be many things that motivate us, but the only worthy motivation is recognition of who he is, who the Lord is, and of what? he has done. That's the only worthy motivation. When men are motivated to follow Christ because they acknowledge him as Lord, as being sovereign over every area of their life, then there will be a glad and willing compliance with his revealed will. Apparently these three men were attracted to Christ as a person. They were in a crowd surrounded, which, which surrounded our Lord. Whatever it was that attracted him, it was a perception of something less than who this man really is. He is Lord. He is Lord. They had other ideas. On this side of the cross, we must not only perceive Christ's true identity as sovereign Lord, we must also acknowledge what he has done in purchasing us with his own blood. Second application, failure to seize the opportunity to follow Christ will inevitably result in regret. These three men had a unique opportunity. They were right in his immediate presence and they failed. They failed to seize the opportunity of a lifetime. And I believe they live to regret it, whether in time or eternity. What a great contrast when we have the ones who Christ called and immediately, immediately they got up and followed him. 
And they knew what it was to have a part in the kingdom of our Lord. Well, we have one final, one final application. It has to do with Mary. Turn with me to John 12, 1. I believe we have time to look at this. John 12, 1. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary, therefore, took a pound of very costly perfume, of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas, Iscariot, one of the disciples who was intending to betray him said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Jesus therefore said, let her alone in order that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And in closing, I simply want to say this. Mary ransacked the house to find the most valuable thing she could find in order to express her devotion to Christ. Do you see what Mary did? She seized, she seized the opportunity. She saw it as a very wonderful opportunity to serve the Lord. And she took advantage of it, even costing her something that was worth a lot of money. Didn't make any difference. There was no holding back. And so, I trust that today, tomorrow, the next day, day after day, we will be very sensitive to and seize these opportunities that God gives us to serve Him, to be in the place where God wants us to be, when He wants us to be there to do what He wants us to do. And so, may God grant that to be true of us. Let's close now in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity to examine and to study your word. May you use it to teach us and to cause us by the work of your spirit in us to conform us more and more to the image of Christ. In whose name we pray, amen.